Hi, Gary Hoover here. You know I love retailing, and I've spent a lot of my life working in retailing, studying retailing, starting retail companies, writing and blogging about retailing, uh, using retail examples in all my speech, speeches and stuff. And so um, recently I was being interviewed for an online interview, and they're talking about big retail trends and changes and what's going to be different about retailing of the future. And I'm like, well, you know, retailing isn't rocket science. And, and the, the interview got picked up. It got broadcast around. And the line, retailing is not rocket science, got some people read it. And I just got a, uh, contacted from one of the uh, speaker bureaus I work with saying uh, one of their clients wanted to know about my speech about um, retailing not being rocket science. And what was that speech like? And did I have any videos of it? And well. It ain't a speech yet, but I got plenty of content and plenty of ideas, and I thought, well, maybe I should talk about it a little bit. What do I really mean when I say retelling is not rocket science? Let me start back. When I look at what I call wisdom, which is what we're always trying to achieve here at uh, Hoover's World and all the stuff I write and the classes I teach and everything, my first rule of, of, of wisdom is that you're trying to figure out what matters and what doesn't matter. So let's start with that. In retailing, what matters are people and products, people and products. Everything else is secondary. So that's kind of the core wisdom. I define a merchant, someone who's a great retailer, as someone who both loves merchandise or products and who loves people. And I'll also say that when I talk about this, I'm talking about merchandise, stuff you sell. You know, I'm talking about Walmart and Sears and Container Store and 7-Eleven and, and Whole Foods Market and all that. But all these basic ideas, I think, apply to service businesses as well. If you're delivering educational services, financial services, airline services, those aren't products, they're services, but the parallels are all the same. So the real keys are thinking about products or services and about people. So thinking about products. The only reason the retail industry even exists, the only reason the good Lord created us retailers was to get the right products into the right people's hands. There are old sayings about the right item at the right price, at the right place, at the right time, and the right quantity. I mean, when a, a, a truckload full of Hershey bars rolls out of the big plant in Hershey, Pennsylvania, it's of no use to anybody. Only when those Hershey bars are in little boxes and groups of six or eight or 12 or whatever, I guess the more the better for the Hershey company, only then do they become useful to society. So it's got to be the right quantity. It's got to be in the right place. You don't need um, umbrellas in the Sahara Desert or bikinis in Alaska in uh, February. Um, and, and it's got to be the right customer, the right time, the right place, the right item and the right price, because that changes over time and varies a lot. So it is so critical, and that's the only reason retailing exists. And so when I look at the product side of it, or the service side, I got to ask, what's different about your store? What's new? What's interesting? What's intriguing to the customer? And that's true at every level. It's every bit as important at Family Dollar Store or at Target as it is at Neiman Marcus or at Nordstrom's. How do you engage people? I think about it when I walk through Macy's, and it's a fine company. I used to work for two of their predecessor organizations. But when I walk through, how often do I see something that really strikes me as new or different? Oh, yeah, I know, the new colors for the season. Maybe the new uh, uh, sleeve lengths or the new style. That in itself isn't new. That's like the same old story. Every year we do this change in the fall and in the spring and in the fall and in the spring and in the fall and in the spring. No, when I go to Target, I'm much more likely to see things that engage and interest me. When I go to a container store, I'm going to see stuff all over that store that I've never seen before. That means that great merchants go dig up new suppliers. They work with suppliers to be creative and think about cool stuff. They don't just stock the same old stuff all the time. And, and then, of course, how they show it in the store, how they merchandise it and all that, that plays a role. But man, it's so important to just engage a customer with cool merchandise.
merchandise with new arrivals. That's the reason great bookstores have got a section saying, you know, just arrived, new arrivals, new hardcovers, new paperbacks, you know, and, and seasonality, you know. They have um, African American History Month in the bookstores and all these other different things that try to engage you. And of course, uh, that, well, they had the 40th anniversary of Woodstock, and Barnes and Noble had a whole table of Woodstock books. So how do you keep it interesting? And I think that a problem with a lot of big retailers is that they've abdicated their, abdicated their responsibility as merchants. They have turned over decisions about what they carry to their suppliers or to some other third party or to computers, you know, and that human passion for merchandise isn't there and the customers see it. So that's products and services. The other side is people. The only reason any enterprise exists is to serve people, to somehow make their lives better or at least more interesting. And we have such a tendency in our society to take a superficial view of all that. To, oh, I don't know, have a, 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 a survey done that's an online survey and ask all these people that we've never seen. We don't know what they look like, whether they're short or tall or black or brown. or We know nothing about them, but we get all the answers back. And we don't even contact them again. We just add them up and say, 48.1% of our customers hate our store or whatever, you know, or love it or whatever. It ain't telling us anything. You gotta genuinely care about the customer. You have to talk to them face to face, even if you're an internet business, especially if you're only an online business. You need to probe, to ask questions, to go deeper. I had some students when I was teaching at the University of Texas, and they had a task of like create a new shampoo, a big contest thing, very cool thing. And, and I said, okay, go out and talk to a bunch of people and ask them all the questions that are obvious questions. Because all your competitors are going to ask these questions too, and you need to know the answers. So ask them, what kind of shampoo do you use? Do you like it or not? What would you do to make it better? Um, uh, is it okay, the color, the bottle? Where do you buy it? What store do you buy it at? Why? Uh, how much do you pay for it? How much of it do you use? Does your spouse use the same shampoo? Whatever. Ask those obvious questions you've got to ask. But where your insights are going to come is when you go beyond that. When you say, well, do you work at home or work out of the home? Or work at all? Do you commute a long way to work or a short way? Do you have kids or not? Do you live alone or are you have family? Where do you go to church? What kind of car do you drive? What was the last movie you saw? And why did, did you like it or not? And why? What radio stations do you listen to? Are you an Apple person? Or are you a, a Wintel, Windows, an Intel person? Only when you begin to see how your product fits into their total life can you begin to understand how your product is used and how it fits in and where there might be opportunities to improve it or better serve your customers. So you've really got to love those customers and, and, and really work hard to put yourself in their shoes. This is not rocket science. This is caring about products or services and caring about people. Achieving all this is not easy. To achieve it and maintain it, to have the discipline to do it every day, to keep caring about your customers, to not get bored by merchandise or by people. It takes work and, and especially takes an enormous amount of work to get a whole organization feeling that way. What great retailers do is they turn everybody in that company, starting at the top, starting at the board of directors, turn everybody in that company into shopkeepers. Because if you look at what a classic shopkeeper does, it's the most basic, straightforward, and important stuff a retailer can do. I was on the board of directors for five years of Whole Foods Market. When I first met John Mackey, the founder, they were doing about $10 million a year out of one store. Today, they do over $9 billion a year, and they've reached out to Europe and all over the United States. And sometimes people say, well, wow, what a miracle. It's just amazing what they do. And if you go to their stores, you know they're just fascinating, cool places, and everybody's in a good mood. And I've had people say, well, that's really advanced retailing, and what a miracle. No, there's nothing advanced about it. What Whole Foods does is exactly what any self-respecting produce merchant would have done in the streets of Florence 400 years ago. What the merchant selling piles of fruits in Bangkok do every day to day in the farmer's markets, you know, of Bangkok. I've toured all those. What the people in the streets of Cairo do. We go to Buena, uh, Rio 
and uh, people are, are taking coconuts and slashing them open, sticking a straw in them, here's your coconut milk drink, and doing all these crazy uh, tropical exotic fruits and doing cool things with them. It's people who love their product and they're sharing that love with their customers. And it is pervasive. And if you've ever met or talked to John Mackey, you know the thing he's really passionate about are natural and organic foods. Good tasting foods that are good for you. And that love saturates that organization. And again, it starts from the top. When I say it, talk about all this, it also means if what matters are people and products, what doesn't matter? Now the things I'm going to list are things that at, at times do matter, and they all play a role. And I don't want to denigrate or uh, lessen the importance of these tasks or make people who do them feel bad. I'll start strategic planning. I was a, a strategic planner, a mergers and acquisitions guy for a big multi-billion dollar retail chain years ago before I became an entrepreneur. And I love doing that. That's kind of like the chess of retailing of, oh, we'll buy them, we'll sell them, whatever. Hey, that is not fundamentally important. That there's a time and a place for it. That is not the guts of successful retailing. Making acquisitions, being big. You know, everybody says, oh, Walmart's big. They're the biggest company in the world, and that's why they're so great. No, they are so big because they're great. They are not great because they're big. Big is irrelevant. Apple is not the biggest computer maker on Earth, especially if you break it into hardware and software and everything. Uh, BMW is not the biggest car maker on Earth, you know? If you get huge and big because you're great, well, then figure out how to live with it. But it can be as much a disadvantage as an advantage. Purchasing power. I remember when Kroger was chasing after Walmart and said, well, the only way we can catch up with them, we got to scale. It's a silly buzzword. Um, we we, we, we got to, you know, get big. And everything. hey, uh, convince me that when one of those guys goes to, say, H.J. Hines, the ketchup dudes, and goes to them and says, oh, you know, I used, to, I used to be a little company. I used to be Kroger. I only bought 18 million bottles of ketchup a year. Oh, no, I bought a bunch of other companies. I'm going to buy 24 million bottles a year. Or even 36 million, twice as many. Do you really think the price of ketchup goes down that much when you move from 18 million to 36 million? These companies were already doing 10, 20, 30 billion a year in sales. What are they going to gain by getting bigger and bigger and bigger? So it's not about buying companies. It's not about distribution centers. Sam Walton, one of my heroes, he was one of the pioneers, along with Charles Lazarus, the guy who created Toys R Us, of building big distribution centers and running all the goods through them. And then I followed that when I created my first chain, uh, Bookstop, the first big book superstore chain. And so I believe in distribution centers, but they're only right for the right company at the right time, the right place. Only if they make it better for your customers and better serve your customers. In, in and of themselves, they do not have value only when they're done right. Finance, accounting, all these things play a role, but they're not fundamental. And when you make a decision about your accounting system, when you make a decision about what company to buy, when you make a decision about uh, uh, whether to use distribution centers or not, the other option would be to ship the stuff directly to the store from the factories. All these HR, human resources, HR personnel <laughs> decisions, um, They've all got to be made in the context of how are they going to affect my customers and their experience. Everything you do, everything you do with store design. And another thing I'd say, we talk about a customer experience and what a great thing it is to go to a Nordstrom's or the great service and all that, or Neiman's and all that. And then people, in general, a lot of times don't talk about a Target or something. Well, it's self-service. That's Hey, running a great self-service store is every bit as hard as running a great full-service store. It's harder. Because since you don't have all that staff there in the store, because you save money and it makes the products less expensive, which is a great gift to your customers, because of that, you have to communicate everything through other means, through signs, through little signals and pathways in the store. So running a, a, the service aspects of a Target are every bit as difficult to pull off as the service aspects of a Nordstrom's. They're just a different kind of ball game. I do have to say in all that, though, that great merchants tend to be very aware of how they use resources. My own, and I think it's true of entrepreneurs in general, but my own approach 
is I design my ideal. I design in my head, this is the way I really want this store to look. This is the way, and whether it's a fancy all marble and mahogany, like uh, Neiman's or whatever, or whether it's a family dollar store or a 7-Eleven or a convenience store, once I got that design in my head, then my main goal is how can I achieve that with the least use of resources? How can I achieve that and be a conservationist? How can I conserve resources, especially capital, especially money? How can I achieve the same effect for 50 grand instead of 100 grand, for $500 instead of $1,000? So there's every reason to be focused on cost, but only within the context of what are you trying to achieve with the customer? And that has to come first. Bottom line on all this is great retailers are organizations where everybody in the organization is in the stores. Obviously, you've got a lot of people working out there, but I'm talking about your management team, your CEO. If you're the CEO of a retail company, what share of your time do you spend in the stores? What share of your time do you ha spend with eye-to-eye -eye conversations with your customers? How much of your time, if you're, even if you're an online company, picking up the phone and calling selected customers, scanning them, living in the stores, talking to customers, looking at merchandise, being in touch with it, not often a bunch of boardrooms or meetings or corporate jets or you know luxury resorts. I mean, all that stuff's okay, but it isn't going to earn your stockholders any more money. It isn't going to benefit your employees and associates. And most of all, it isn't going to benefit your customers. And ultimately, they're going to be the ones that decide whether your company is successful or not. That's my two bits about retailing and probably applies to most other industries. This is Gary Hoover. I'll see you later.